518. And um, so we've been kind of just dipping into Psalms in a few places. And so let me just remind you a little bit of, of, of what the Psalms are. The, the Psalms are actually songs of worship. God inspired the authors of these, and, and that inspiration period occurred over almost a thousand years with the first of the Psalms being written by Moses, and then long at, David wrote, wrote many of them, King David, and then later on many others wrote them. And God, over a thousand years, inspired songs of worship that his people could use to celebrate him and engage in genuine, sincere, meaningful worship. And so those were collected over that thousand years, and they're kind of laid out in ours and in our Bibles in five books as it as it went along, and and it's appropriate, I think, that in the midst of these songs of worship, God actually told us some stuff about worship. And and let me state it this way: it's it it it's just this simple. That's a Lawrence phrase, <laughs> for those who have been around. It's just this simple. The reason why we have the book of Psalms is because worship matters. God wouldn't have given us songs of worship. He wouldn't have resourced us so that we can worship him if worship wasn't important. There is just something about the creator-creature dynamic, the father-child dynamic, the god and his creation dynamic that demands worship from us. And when we don't have worship, it, it, you know, it might seem like it's working, but it's just really not working. Uh, yesterday, as I got out of our meetings, I ran home, and I want to cut my grass before I got gone for, for a little bit of time. And, uh, and the belt kept popping off of my mower deck. And... Uh, and the frustration levels were going up and up and up. And, and you'd put it on there and say, it looked perfect, and then it wouldn't work. You'd pull the, you know, and, and, and there's some ways, it, it looks like our lives are put together, but when we really put the pressure on it, because we haven't really engaged in that appropriate design of worship with God. Now, I do want to get into our text today, but, but let's just revisit a definition of worship that we've used here at Hope Chapel for all of us. And, and again, defining worship is a lot like trying to define love, right? You can say lots of stuff, and at the end of the day, there's still a lot of other things you could say. But for us, the way we've looked at worship is it is those moments in our journey where we intentionally look at and celebrate the extreme value of God, and then we adjust our lives to be centered around that value. It's not just that we come in and are excited about God and we walk out and nothing ever changes in our lives. It's through our understanding and our celebration and valuing our, who God is and, and, what, and, and, and just how worthy he is, how glorious he is. And then we actually adjust our lives to say, I want that at the center of who I am. And, and so it, in that spirit, let's take a look at Psalm 84. Psalm 84. Some of you are going to, when we get to a certain verse, you're going to say, I know this, right? Better is one day, right? Better is one day than a thousand elsewhere when we're with God. Listen to these words as God shares them with us. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord of armies. I long and yearn for the courts of the Lord the temple area where they could worship. I long and I yearn for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh, they, they cry out for the living God. Even a sparrow finds a home and a swallow, a nest for herself where she places her young. Near your altars, Lord of armies, my king and my God. That's really almost like a prayer. God, God, let me let my home be near your altars. How happy, how blessed are those who reside in your house and who praise you continually. Happy are the people whose strength is in you, 
whose heart are set on pilgrimage. And this was probably a song, a, a, a worship song that would be sung as people were making pilgrimage to Jerusalem for worship. If you know a little bit about biblical history with the people of God, you know, there was exiles and etc. And, and the people were living in, in many places outside of the Holy Land. But the Torah asked them to come and, and, and commanded them to come and try to worship in Jerusalem at the temple for three different festivals every single year. Passover, what they knew was Pentecost, which was a celebration of when God gave Moses the Torah and the Ten Commandments, and, 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 then, the, and then the Feast of, of um, Tabernacles, which took place in the fall. And so they would make this journey, and this was a song that they would sing, and, 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 and as a part of this, it says, how, how happy are the people whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a source of spring water. Even the autumn rain will cover it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. Each appears before God in Zion. Yeah, Steve, just make sure that door is closed. That's our compressor filling up the pipes above us so water won't come out of the sprinklers and give you a shower before you get home. All right, so Lord God of armies, let me dial you back in. All right, here we go. Lord God of armies, hear my prayer. Listen, God of Jacob. Consider our shield, God. Look on the face of your anointed one. Better one day, better a day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Better one day in God's court than two and a half years or more. Better part of three years anywhere else. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than live in the tents of wicked people. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord grants favor and honor. He does not withhold the good from those who live with integrity. Happy is the person who trusts in you, Lord of armies. Now this psalm primarily talks about the benefits of worship, the blessings that come from worship. But before we go there, and that's where I want to spend some time today, that's what I've titled the message, The Benefits of Worship, I want us to make sure that we actually understand the type of worship that leads to the benefits that God intends to give us because we worship him in spirit and in truth. And, and just, just take a look at some of the words that he uses here, the, the, the type of worship. You know, he, verse 2, I long and I yearn for the courts of the Lord. My, my heart and my flesh, all of my being, they, they cry out. They're consumed with wanting to be with the living Lord, right? It, it's, it's this idea of, you know, just knowing that one day with God is better than going to a thousand days filled of championship parades. That's what it means to be in the tents of the wicked. To be in a place where you're just living life to the fullest and partying up and it's the part of you, whatever. It's better than one day in God's court than having a lifetime of what looks great on Instagram and Facebook, the way he puts it, right? And, and so you look at all this and, and I, I, these, these, these strong words and, and the idea that comes to me, there's a couple of things that, that come to me as I think... One other thing I want you to see here, and I mentioned this earlier, happy are the people whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. This isn't just something that, you know, I'll get around to it. But this is a consuming desire. It, your heart is set on going to a place where you can connect. What kind of worship is that all about? And, I, and, and some of the words that kind of stand to me, uh, out to me, is one, it, this, is, this is like having a homesickness for God. 
You know, just this ache for God. And, 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 it, and it's just something you can't make go away. And, and the only way you're going to satisfy it is to actually get back to him, to get to the place of worship, to be connected with him. You know, um, it's interesting, uh, you know, over uh, my journey, there's been lots of, of ways in which I've, you know, I've been engaged with it. And, and, you know, we've had people who, who moved to this region and they just really missed home. And over a period of time, they just got to a place where I, I need to go back home. Christina and I, the other day, we're, were picking Lawrence up at, at, at where he was staying. And we bumped into this couple, and they actually initiated the conversation. They said, hey, you know, hey, how do you like your Ford Fusion, right? Because, oh, we had one. We're thinking about getting another one or whatever. And they had moved to Alabama. Sorry, Celeste. They had moved to Alabama, to Huntsville, you know, like their kids told me, you need to go someplace. They got down there. They've been there less than a year, and they're coming back to Lemon Start because they're just homesick. This, this is, they, they ache for it. This is what he's talking about. This is not something I can do with, you know, I love whatever. I need to get back to where's home. And then this sense of determination. You know, I mean, these pilgrimages, this is not like they just walk from here to the town square. These were people who, just like the Magi, they were on the road for weeks, even months, to get to Jerusalem so they could participate in the Passover celebration or celebrate God giving the Torah, giving the law. Or they, they, they were determined, it took lots of prep, right? And they were determined, and they were. And, and we're going to look at a piece of this with the Valley of Back in just a moment. It, it, this wasn't like a cakewalk. You know, you and I, we, we walk to the airport, we climb on an airplane, they turn on the air conditioning or turn up the heat, they charge us now for food, they didn't used to do that, right? And then a few hours later we get off and we're in Hawaii. That's not the way it worked in those days. <laughs> and, and, and so there's a sense of determination. I, I'm going somewhere with this and we'll get done with it. Just stay there with me. The, the image that comes to my mind is, is that of, many of you know that Christina and I have like a third son, Arthur, who's here from Rwanda. And Arthur, it, it, it was his determination that he wanted to make a life in America instead of in Rwanda. He searched around, he found a way, and he landed up at a small little Christian school of like 18 people in the flatlands of Montana, about 10 miles from the Canadian border. It, it was the only way he could get into the country. And to stay as a student, he not just got a bachelor's degree, he got a master's degree, and then he got another master's degree. And, I mean, he would do it. He, he'd, it'd start snowing, he'd go out with his shovel and start knocking on people's doors you need because he needed to make money or whatever and 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 but he was determined i am staying here that's just a little different than like you know the weather's going to be pretty nice today i can go to the beach i can catch youtube later i can do, you know and and he's determined he's going to be here and, and and that's the kind of, of thing. the way i look at it is this the only way that kind of at worship happens it's not an act of duty. It's an act of love. You're not here because you should be here. You're here because there's no other place you want to be. And it's not just this sanctuary area. But when we think of it, it's, it's not like, well, I, I, I should read my Bible in the morning and offer some praise and thanks to God. And then a couple of, there's nothing I'd rather do. There's nothing I'd rather do. And, and, and it, has to be, it has to be this act of love that, that comes with it. And, and those of you who are married, you know the difference between something that you, you know the difference between doing something because you should and because you really want to. The impact on your spouse is a lot different, is it not? And, and, and so it's, this is a huge piece for us. And I got to tell you, I think this is an area where a lot of us need to sit and think a little bit. Because we live in an era where, where worship is often about me and not about God. I'm here because I need to get, I, 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 need, I need something before I start Monday. 
You know, it, it, this is what it does to inspire me, to enlist, to uh, uplift me, to, you know, to encourage me or give me hope. Or it's where I get to see my friend. And, and, and that's a me-centered piece. Listen, and God's going to tell us all about the benefits that come, but it starts with a God-centered focus. We're, we, we worship God because we are head over heels in love with him and because of how great he is. He is the sun and the shield, the one who gives grace and glory and, sh- and hands out goodness to those who live with integrity. So let's look at these blessings, all right? I got some time left, right? So I've <laughs> let's take a look at this. There, there, I think there are four primary ones, and we're going to look at the verses that use the word happy, all right, or use the word, some of your translations would use the word blessed. And the first one is verse 4. How happy are those who reside in your house, who praise you continually. The first blessing of genuine worship, worship that is, is drawn out by God, is motivated by love in our hearts, it's, it's places where we're, where we're making it all about him, the gift that God gives us is relationship with him. You are at home with him. You're at a place you know you're in his presence, in his care, and he's looking over you. He uses the imagery here. You know, a, a bird finds a place where they can build a nest and it's safe. We, we have, a, we have a, a, a room that's kind of built like a deck off the back of our house, and, and, and almost annually, they set up, a bird set up and build a nest in an area underneath it. And so earlier this year, we had, we had a bird that came in, laid a couple eggs, See the chicks or whatever. Christina looks in it again yesterday. There's four more eggs in there. The first ones are already gone. Now there's more in there. You know, they, they have a place where they can raise a family. They feel secure, protected, etc. That's the gift that we get when we worship. We, we, we know we're in relationship. We know we're in the presence of God. It's like we get to dwell in his courts and praise him, right? And 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 Listen, it is a marvelous thing to be able to get up in the morning, look in the mirror, and as you're shaved, thinking, what I'm seeing in the mirror, that person is a child of God. Has a little less hair than he used to. And it's a little grayer than it used to be. That person's a child of God, and he matters to the most important and most powerful and unique being in the universe. It it, it is a marvelous gift to have the assurance of that salvation. And and it it starts with faith in God, because without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so he just said, you know, how happy are those who know that they are living in the presence of God? It's a gift and a joy that's given to them all the time. That's what flows to us when we worship God. We remember who he is and who he is to us, And we have that gift. Here's the second thing I want you to see. Look just a little further down. Verses 5 through 7. Happy are the people whose strength is in you. And it would be easy just to say, well, you know what? This is, the the, the benefit is strength. But, But he's talking about something different here. He's talking about a strength that allows us to actually transform the experiences that are going on in our lives. How do I say that from the text? Just take a look at this. You know, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage, they pass through the valley of Baca. The word Baca means tears. So they're passing through the valley of tears. The reason why it was known as the valley of tears is it was an extremely arid place, and it was one of the worst stretches of the journey to Jerusalem for many of the pilgrimages. And people would get there, and it was just... It was arid, it was dry, there was no water, there was no, no shade, no anything, and it was, just, it was just a difficult stretch. It was heartbreak hill on the way to Jerusalem. And notice what it says here. Happy are those whose strength are in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, Baca this place where it's arid and desolate and dangerous and difficult, they make it a source of spring water. They turn it into an oasis. 
Even the autumn rain will cover it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. They don't, they don't get weaker. They get stronger. It doesn't wear them out. It builds them up. They go from strength to strength. They just keep getting stronger. And you know what happens? They each make it to the end of the journey. They appear before God in Zion. They finish well. And, and so what he's saying to us is that as you and I worship God, God, the gift that God gives us is that we, we are able to transform all the experiences that are going on our journey in a way to make us stronger, fuller, more mature, and we are equipped to finish well. And we're going to finish this journey well with God. It, it, it's marvelous stuff. And, and all of us, I think, can stop and, and think about people we know who've gone through very difficult moments, and it could break people. It could make people embittered and, 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 depress, and, and, and pessimistic and all those things, and they've done just the opposite. They've gotten stronger, and they're giving more. And it's, it's a marvelous piece that goes with it, it, it incredible stuff. And, and that's what he's talking about here. We, we've witnessed a little bit of this in Rwanda. You go into a church, and there's an individual there whose family was slaughtered in the genocide. And they were the first one to grant forgiveness to the genociders as they get released from prison. Powerful stuff. And he makes us strong. He transforms the experiences of our lives as we worship him in spirit and in truth. We also get the blessing of prayer. Look at verse 8. Lord God of armies, he's talking to, to the Father, hear my prayer. And this is what, listen to God of Jacob. And, and they, when he uses the phrase, consider our shield, God. Look on the face of your anointed one. He's actually offering an intercession for the king. The king is your means of providing protection and prosperity and strength and et cetera for we as a people. And he's offering up a prayer to him. And he's saying, God, hear my prayer. And part of the gift of worship is knowing that God actually hears our prayer. And here's the way I think about it. I think there's a lot of people who sit in churches like ours, and when they pray, they think they're just really, it feels much more like they're making a wish. They're, they're, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like making your wish and blowing out your birthday candles on your cake, right? You, you hope it comes true. And that's the way that they approach prayer. But when we really genuinely worship God and we're connected with the one we know who can answer the prayers, we're not just, we're not, we're not just wishing. We're praying. We're changing things. You know, Jesus put it this way. He said, you know, if, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. It's in John chapter 14, but it's in many other places in the scripture as well. And when you and I are worshiping God, we know that the prayers that we are offering are shaking up the world, shaking up our lives, and changing things for the better. And that's why James tells us that the prayer of a righteous person really changes things. And, and, and you and I, when we worship the creator, in spirit and truth. It's an act of love, not just, but, and, and, and all the pieces. When we genuinely worship God, what we get is we understand that our prayers are making a difference. And, and, and we know that they're answered. Now, admittedly, they're not always answered the way we'd like to. Right? But we know that God is answering those prayers. And so it's the gift of that assurance of prayer. Got one last piece. And it comes out of the very last verse. Happy is the person who trusts in you, Lord of armies. I, I love that he uses that name of God. He said, happy is the one who trusts in you, Lord of armies. When, when you and I are worshiping God in sincerity and in truth, one of the benefits that comes to us is the ability to trust God, to lean on him. And to follow along. And, and, and it's a gift that God's trying to give us. And it's interesting. Notice what he says just before that. He says, the Lord grants favor and honor. He does not withhold the good for those who live with integrity. And, 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 I, and I think he's connecting that with the word trust. Because here's, here's what happens often in our lives. We believe this about God, but we act this way. 
Do you know what I mean? We believe this about God, but we act this way. Very simple illustration out of my journey with Christina. We, we, we get married. We're both in school. You know, we got two tuition payments. We got a car payment. We join a church, and, and, and we're tithing to the church, and they're having a building campaign, and we're giving money to the building campaign, and et cetera. And yet here I am. I'm teaching college students, and I'm talking to them about bringing first fruits before the Lord. But I'm waiting till the end of the month to see if I, could, I can afford to give. And I said, you know, I, I, I'm teaching one thing, but I'm doing something different. And so if I'm going to have integrity, I need to give up front and see what God does. And, and, and for some of you who have been around here a long time, I've preached over a thousand sermons here. You've probably heard this tale before. But there were moments we would give at the beginning of the month, and there was more month at the end of our money. Anybody ever experienced that, right? Is, you know, and we're like, what are we going to do? And I, I got to drive to seminary. It's 50 miles away. I got no money to put any gas in the car. And it, and it was amazing the way that God showed up and met needs. And you learn to trust him. It's incredible stuff. And, 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 and one of the gifts is that when we worship God, in reality, the hard stuff that he asks us to do, we actually believe, you know what, I should do that. Because... I trust him. I really should turn the other cheek. I should pray for those who persecute me. And, and right on down the line. And, and one of the, my funny story, you know, every church, Texas churches, let's just limit to Texas churches, right? We had a lot of change going on in the church we were in and whatever. And there was a small Sunday school class of older adults who really didn't like the fact that they had their room changed and other things. And people were sitting in their seats and all that kind of stuff. And so they, they were the kind of people that as a staff member, when it came to a Sunday morning, you tried to avoid them as they were headed towards you because you knew you were going to get an earful. And their intent was, I'm going to tell you so you can tell the pastor. Right, and and so there was one of those months where I, you know, we just we weren't sure how we didn't have enough money at the end of the month, and one of the, and and the like the worst guy is headed towards me, and I'm like, uh oh, you know, and I'm trying to find a way, but he had me cornered, and he and he reaches out and he shakes my hand, and when I pull it away, there's a couple hundred dollars in my hand, and part of the reaction is I can trust him. And, and, and that's what God, you know, that's what God is, that's why God calls us to worship him. Because when you and I make genuine contact with the Lord of armies, the one who, who knows it all, can do it all, has all the power, is good and loving, and is like a sun and a shield to us, to use the words of the psalmist. When you and I worship him, he said, I can trust him with what I'm going through. And I can trust him to obey him and to walk with him. So here's, here's what the psalmist is really asking us to do. Really worship God. Really worship God. Because God wants to bless you by really worshiping him. Let's pray together. Father, give us hearts that are determined to celebrate who you are. And let us know the joy of spending at least one day rather than a thousand somewhere else with you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.